My name is Tim Cosper. I'm the IT Director of Operations at Freedom Mortgage. Uh, a lot of stuff falls underneath that, uh, mainly because we are not uh, a super huge IT organization. Uh, I think we're pretty right-sized for the size of the company. Um, given which way the wind is blowing, day of the week, we're anywhere from 6,500 to 6,800 employees. IT, somewhere in the mid-400s, um, uh, supporting those. That's uh, contractors, onshore, offshore, everyone included. So uh, currently, uh, the things underneath uh, you know, my control are enterprise change. I have DevOps. Um, I just inherited enterprise monitoring. Um, we're running a project f to rebuild our lower test environments. I have uh, test automation for operations. Uh, so a number of things there that, that kind of all play very well together. And um, I want to talk today about justifying the journey. So I don't know how many of you folks are, are here thinking about, you know, hey, uh, this is something, you know, I'm, I want to do. How do we get started? Um, so I want to share a little bit about uh, you know, what we did, our journey, and uh, hopefully that will help you guys out, answer some questions. And then at the end, obviously, if you have any questions, uh, by all means, uh, let, me, let us know. Um, so why I'm the unlikely candidate, uh, it actually doesn't really hold too much water anymore because cause Gene Kim this morning was like, hey, number one is like IT operations director. So, um, you know, more for me, it, it's more about um, not having any background in development. So I've never spent one day coding. Um, I don't know anything about development other than it's a little bit of magic, right? Some guys do some stuff, and then some other stuff comes out the other end, and uh, that wasn't there before, right? Operations, uh, for the operations folks here, you, right? It's about keeping the lights on, keeping things running, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, our production environments, um, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing to, to drive revenue. So um, the reason why... Uh, that really fell on us, uh, and I think uh, you guys have probably heard a lot about this uh, today, and uh, you know I've heard about this in the past, is that uh, from an operations perspective, right, we were the end of the line. We were seeing the impact of not having um, a better delivery pipeline, right, of not being able to focus on how we were delivering our software um, and, and allowing folks to just, you know, based on what silo they were in, kind of doing what they were wanting, we were we were feeling that at the, uh, at the point of failure. So, um, you know, we said, you know, we have to rein this in. And, um, you know, our, our group uh, has been very successful with implementing uh, over the past 18 months. And so they said, you know, we're going we're gonna to give it to you guys and see what happens. Um, background of Freedom Mortgage, um, we've been around since 1990, um, mainly have grown through acquisition. Uh, so we are in uh, the top 10 uh, mortgage servicing uh, companies in the country. I think we just passed 120 billion in servicing, um, which is still a fire cry off from uh, number one, uh, which is which is Quicken. Um, you guys probably seen the Rocket Mortgage ads and stuff. And so, um, but what but what we're doing today, and why we really needed to move in that direction was was not about hey this is the coolest thing right, coming down the pipe. This was more about um, we're killing ourselves supporting these software deployments, right? So, so we really do need to make a change or else, you know, I don't know, people are going to fall over, they're going to quit, something's going to happen drastic, right? And we, we wanted to avoid that. So when I started in January 2016, we were probably about here. So we had, I guess, some stuff maybe, right? We've all seen this evolutionary chart. Um, still... Uh, not a whole heck of a lot uh, going on. We, we, we were using things like Jenkins and we had Git and, uh, you know, they started using Maven, you know, a bunch of these uh, fun little terms that, uh, that, that everyone knows. Um, and, and today, actually like this month, we're probably about here. So you'll notice we have, we have a tool in our hand now, right? And, and so, um, you know, the whole Excel uh, suite is, has been that tool for us, right? That's been our really our, our, our kind of first foray, foray into, uh, you know, on, on this journey. So um, we're, we're really working to integrate a bunch of different tools, using that tool uh, to, to help us uh, to eventually maybe get to a point where uh, we're actually fully walking upright and, and we're deploying um, at a pace that, uh, you know, can, can keep up with the competition. So 
to start off with, um, you know, one of the things that, that, we, that we don't do very well and we didn't do very well um, was, was around documentation. And so I'm not really going to dazzle you with my technical knowledge. Um, I, probably not even in the, in the top 90% of the people smart in this room. Um, so I just surround myself with really smart people and then they, they make me look smart too. Uh, that's, uh, that's really how I like to, to approach things, right? So, but what I do and, and what has really helped us be successful is I focus on the process. And when we're talking about starting your journey, selling your journey and getting people to buy in, it's largely about the process, right? Because you can go around and talk to people that will tell you about any tool that works, right? I mean, you take the right tool in the right environment and, and you can pick any tool and they'll say, oh yeah, we've had success with that tool, right? But if you really want to be uh, successful over the long run, you really have to have processes in place that are going to support your success. And so, uh, you know, you really have to focus on putting together a very strong business case and then supporting it as you move through. So uh, what are you doing well, right? So, you know, it, it may seem like a nightmare on, on deployment day, uh, deployment weekend, right? Um, but it can't be all bad. Right? You got to be doing some things well, right? Maybe, uh, maybe your delivery team, uh, you know, is very efficient at the way they execute, right? But maybe it's just the code that's not getting there uh, clean, uh, or maybe your developers are very good, uh, but you kind of fall short when it's time to deliver. Um, maybe QA, um, you know, needs to have some extra resources added. To whatever it is, uh, wherever you're falling short, it, it it can't be a total loss, right? So identify the things that you are doing well, and then obviously make sure that you keep in mind that you could be part of the problem, right? Whatever your role is, right? Whether you're in development, operations, engineering, architecture, uh, you have to be able to look at yourself in the mirror and, and say, you know, am I part of the problem? And, and not necessarily, you know, obviously you personally, right? But, but are my practices, my policies, the things that I endorse in my organization, are, are they really hindering us from moving forward, right? And you have to be willing to accept that. And, and it can be difficult, right? Because we, have, we all have uh, you know, egos around our own things, right? And we, we uh, sometimes feel like um, it's everyone else, right? It's, oh, it's, it's that guy. He's, he's the problem. That guy's the problem. It's not me, right? So you have to be willing to take that hard look at yourself, right? And, and ask for feedback. Go uh, talk to people and say, hey, you know, is there anything going on in my organization that um, could change to help this, right? And, and um, you're probably going to get a lot of good feedback, right? People, but as soon as you open the door for people, right, and, and they feel like they can be honest with you, they'll tell you. Um, and then really, it's, it's identifying your pain points, right? So, um, you know, maybe there's only one, right? Maybe, maybe it's only at, uh, you know, the way you actually uh, get your code from your developers into your test environments. But maybe there's multiple. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe it's your, around QA testing. Maybe it's around, you know, it taking six months to get something to production. Um, maybe it's around the number of people, right, and, and uh, quality of life issues, right? But identify those and, and write those down um, because the whole point of this is you got to put it in front of people, right? Because you can talk about things all day long, right? We talk about things with our friends. You talk about things at work, um, and then you go home, right? And then, you know, you, you go on with your life. Um, but when you put it down on paper and it's something you can see every day and it's something you can visualize and something your, your executives are looking at, um, it, it's there, right? You vocalize it now, right? And now everyone has to either accept it or, de or deny it, right? Um, and by, by putting it down on paper, it, it, it makes your intentions very clear. And then, and then at the very end, obviously tying it all together. Um, and for us, this was really about uh, where is the money, right? Where, how are we losing money or how are we not making more money? By following the status quo, okay? And this is something probably very near and dear to your executive hearts, right? Um, if, if you just say, hey, I want to do this, and then they say, well, okay, well, what's the benefit? What are we going to gain out of it? Well, it's a cool tool, right? It'll be fun, right? We'll have fun doing it, right? right? You know how far that's going to go, right? But as soon as you can start talking about um, ROI and you can start talking about hard saves and soft saves, uh, those are the things that are going to get people's attention, right? And even though your intention is to really do the cool stuff, right? It's, it's a good way to, to make that sell. Um, driving decisions through metrics. So this is something I'm sure everyone uh, is, is, is very familiar with, right? We're, I'm very big on metrics, right? If you can't show me, then I don't believe you, 
right? And that's just my general theory and my general approach, right? If you don't have some numbers, I'm just not going to believe it. And so when we started in January, so the first five months of 2016, we started gathering these metrics, right? Because in the change system, right, it's very easy. You, you have tickets. Those tickets are approved. Those tickets are executed against. Those tickets are tracked, right? It's a very simple process, right? And, and so for the first five months of 2016, we averaged about 290 changes per month. Um, and, and to note here, we do three uh, weekends per month, right? So the last weekend is, is a change freeze. Um, and so like, with the exception of sometimes you get those months where like, uh, you know, the Saturday is the first, right? So maybe you get four, uh, four releases uh, every now and then. But for the most part, uh, three weekends a month, 290 changes. And what we found was we were experiencing about eight failed changes a month. Now, I could break that down, um, and, and, and I did as part of my overall presentation, but uh, that failure could just be, hey, um, you know what, the, we wanted blue, and uh, you gave us green, and you know how people are complaining. Uh, that failure could also mean, oh, by the way, you um, upgraded not just uh, your portion of the code, but uh, you upgraded everyone else's, right? So um, for the next three hours, we're going to be offline entirely fixing that, right, getting that back to where it should be. So um, those failures, although you know, I'm not going to go into the quantitative here, um, were easy to show, right, through outages, right, through major incidents. Last seven months, um, we actually upped our number of changes and reduced the number of failed changes to 1.3 per month. You can see our little chart here on the right. Uh, drastic decline uh, in June of 2016. So what do we do? Had nothing to do with tools, had everything to do with painful process and, and putting people through the ringer on a given weekend. So for the first five months of the year, we deployed on Sunday nights at 10 p.m. and people stuck their code in. And you woke up the next morning on Monday with your fingers crossed and you brought your fire extinguisher into work, ready to put out fires all day Monday. Starting in June uh, of last year, we said, you know what, we're gonna go to Saturday nights, we're gonna put a change manager on with you, we're gonna get our level one support, we're gonna open up bridges, and Sunday morning, anyone who has a change, you're gonna need someone from the business to come in and validate that change at 7 a.m. on Sunday morning. And, um, you know, people didn't like that, right, they complained. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we got endorsement from our CIO, from our business VPs, right, because they saw the pain that was going on in the environment. And literally, I mean, you can see May was our highest month. In one month, we went from 14 failed changes to one, right? But what was the cost, right? So the first five months, yeah, okay, we got five, about five people on the weekend, right, deploying the codes manually about two hours, right, they'd push their code, log off, and that was it. And given some conservative uh, numbers at about $50 an hour, we said, okay, so it's $500 a weekend to, for folks. Not counting the, the, the human factor, right, quality of life, right, Saturday to Sunday night, right, we're doing deployments. Um, last seven months, average about 25 people, right, so not only did we have the change implementers, we had validators, we had back out folks, um, uh, had to be on call. Um, three to five hours because we moved our windows back to Saturday night and then validating on Sunday morning. Um, exponential rise in cost, right? So you add all those people together and uh, you get something like this, right? So under the old regime, about $19,000 a year. Not bad, right? Give or take, depending on the number of deployments. Um, for the last seven months out of the year, about $240,000, right? Yes. Right, no, that, that's, that, that's not even that. We're not even counting that, right? So that doesn't even go into account uh, because those are normal. We're, we're, we're doing those during business hours, right? So we're just counting the after hours work, right, which would normally be considered outside your 40 hours, right, I guess. Um, and, yeah, it was very tough to, to quantify what they were losing on Monday, right, uh, by not, um, you know, doing something else. Um, the other part of this uh, that... Uh, again, we're, we're, we're trying to focus back around on, I think it was something uh, that Gene had mentioned earlier in the day, was, so on the weekend, developers, you know, they would, they, would, they would pass the code off to operations. Operations would deploy, 
and then the developers were <laughs> nowhere to be found, right? You tried to call, um, you know, you might as well be trying to call the president, right? Uh, so, but they'd be there Monday morning, right? And everyone would, would kind of gather around and they would help. So, um, you know, what that took away from maybe their development efforts on a Monday uh, was, again, hard to substantiate uh, just because of, uh, you know, the timing. So maybe, maybe you'd have one developer uh, trying to fix three changes uh, or you'd have 10 developers trying to fix two, right? Um, so this was just the straight math on the number of people on that weekend. Um, so what that led us to do was we said, you know, we got to find a better way, right? There has to be something we can do that uh, will help us get this beast under control because we're burning people out, right? 25 resources on a weekend. Uh, again, it's a small IT organization, right? 400 some people, uh, for some may sound like a lot, for others, you guys, that's, that's nothing, right? Um, uh, for us, I mean, that's across all channels, all departments. So, for example, the guys that deploy um, our web changes, right, our WebSphere guys, we have three. That's it in the entire organization. So um, they rotate, right? They get once a month, and, they, and they're on. Uh, they do those deployments. And uh, if someone's on vacation, well, now you're picking up another weekend, right? And if there's issues on Sunday, now you're back on Sunday. Um, and I definitely came from... Um, a, a place of, you know what, if we're going to lead this effort, then we're really going to lead it. So it, from June till the end of the, uh, the last year, um, I worked every single weekend we had a deployment. So um, on average, I would work 21 straight days. So I was on every Saturday night. I was on every Sunday morning. And um, I wasn't going to ask folks to do things that I wasn't willing to do myself. And that was a big part of it, right? So people saw the commitment and they saw, you know what? Okay, so this guy wants to drive change into our processes um, and he's willing to, to go and experience the pain with us, right? But we had to do that, where we had to show folks that, that we were serious about this, right? And this was something that, um, you know, you, you had to see some of that pain before you could actually appreciate the relief, right? And I think, I think Jeannie even said this morning, right? Go work on the floor of that manufacturing plant somewhere else for a little while before you can actually understand, uh, you know, what you're going to earn, right, by, by going a different route. And so uh, we're real big on these infographics, right, the one deck slides are, are, you know, people like to see those, you know, organizations. So we said, you know what, what are the areas in, inside of, of my, my sphere of control? So we have change, release, environment management, and automation testing. And so some of those, these tools we have in-house some of the tools were working on, uh, you know, uh, either betas or POCs. And so Footprints, um, uh, for those of you who don't are familiar with Footprints, it's the little brother, I'd say, to Remedy, um, which is uh, more your enterprise. Again, I think, um, you know, we brought Footprints in when we were a much smaller organization, when IT was under 100 people. So it, it definitely fit uh, where we were uh, organizationally. Um, and then, you know, bringing in deploy and release uh, has really... Uh, started us down that path of getting a better handle on how we do our deployments and how we actually release our software, right, and give us that tracking mechanism, right? Up until now, it's just been looking at change records, right, and, and doing some, running some reports and seeing what time the, the ticket was actioned, right, and then doing some math, what time was it closed, right? Um, but you don't really get to, to, to capture everything that happens along the way. Um, and then we have environment management, uh, one of our big challenges uh, was uh, our, our lower environments, right? So, uh, you know, you're, you're deploying this code, and that's great, right? If you have the environment to deploy it to, right? And if that environment is sound. And, um, and you know, our, our environments uh, right now are, are in some rough shape. So we're looking at, and we have a big project going right now uh, with SkyTap to see if they're going to be able to provide us some relief in terms of how we spin up and virtualize our, our environment. So, um, uh, you know, people have been talking about this, uh, you know, all day today, right, about the containers and virtualization. You guys, I'm sure, are all very aware of that. And um, in our environment, unfortunately, we have a very unique challenge, and that is our main systems run on AIX on power processors, right? So if you've tried to virtualize that, it doesn't happen, right? except with SkyTap. So SkyTap is the first company um, that in, I guess in March, they started offering uh, through a beta program 
uh, this ability to virtualize your AIX on power. And um, so we're in a beta with them right now. If that works, um, then you know, we can bring Docker and we can bring a lot of these automation tools into play uh, in, in environments that we currently can't do. Um, and so that's, you know, we're crossing our fingers there, right? That, that, that's, a big, uh, that's a big project for us. And if that works, uh, should definitely make um, uh, building and spinning up those environments easier. And if not, you know, we're, we're stuck in a very traditional uh, place, right? Where we have to build out manually. And if someone wants to test environment, right? We got to create it, we got to, you know, and we can't tear it down, right? Cause it's, it's physical. Um, and, uh, and you know, that's, that's really, uh, you know, we're, we're really hoping that works out. Uh, and then last we have automation testing, right? So uh, we're building that in now where, where the deployments that we are doing, um, you know, we have some uh, UFT, so formerly QTP, if you guys are familiar with that, and Selenium in house that we run automation testing against, right? We call those uh, and test those builds uh, when they get deployed on dev, test, and UAT. Um, and that's really, you know, again, there are a bunch of other tools back. I mean, we have Jenkins and Jira and a bunch of other things, but these are really the things that fall within um, the area that, that I have uh, control over and uh, really represents the entire pipeline. Uh, for what we're trying to do. Um, let me go forward here. What we have left remaining uh, in this year. So we, we definitely um, are, are very uh, aware of, of our timelines and timeframes. Um, you know, I don't know about your organizations, but, but you know, where we're at, people like to see results, right? They, they want to see things quickly. We're not an organization of We'll start in 2017, see in 2019, right? We don't run like that. Um, part of what makes us successful, not just from an IT perspective, but a business perspective is our ability to be, to be agile, not just agile methodology, but I mean actually agile, right? So, so being able to react to market conditions, right? When things like uh, Dodd-Frank or Graham Leach-Bailey or you know, whatever the next you know, regulation is around the housing industry comes along, we'll be able to react in weeks, right? Not months or half years or whatever, right? Um, so where we're at today is uh, we actually have um, XLD uh, installed and, and configured in our environment. We're working through applications now, onboarding them. Uh, we have uh, three applications that we've brought in and we're doing it very slowly. So this is not, you know, again, we're doing, we didn't just, all right, it works and we're turning it on, right, in mass. This is definitely something where we're watching it. It's very controlled. We have not yet uh, automated anything. We're, we're watching very closely each step. Uh, we have people still pushing the buttons, right, if you will, um, and making sure that everything is going through smoothly. So as much as people want to see this happen, obviously they want to see it happen in the right way, right? They're very interested in ensuring that what we're doing uh, is not breaking production, not you know ruining things um, for the rest of the organization. So. So in June, here we are with full prod deployments. Um, uh, by the end of this month, we're also going to be introducing um, our major change process, right, which will be tied into change management and release, which, um, you know, we have some definitions around. But basically, you know, your big changes, right? Hey, we got to bring down the entire system on a given weekend, okay? That's not something you do or tell me about on Tuesday, right? I can't, I can't hear about that on Tuesday for a Saturday deployment, right? So... Um, that process is going into place. We have our first automated scripts in production scheduled for July. So right now we're using test automation to run uh, daily system health checks. We run against some, our production environment on an hourly basis uh, to tell us how things are doing, uh, to help catch uh, things that maybe have gone in but, but aren't necessarily realized, right? So um, sometimes, you know, you put a change in on a weekend and uh, if a very specific situation isn't met, right, you may not see that failure come Monday morning, right? It may materialize on a Thursday uh, because you get a very specific type of loan or you get a very specific user that logs in, right? Uh, and so we run these on an hourly basis uh, to ensure we're catching those things uh, along the way. Uh, performance test integration in August, we're targeting that as well. Um, new change management workspace in September Cloud scalable test environment, if all goes well with SkyTap in October, and then XLR full integration in November. So we really don't have anything to do, you know, the rest of the year here. This is really, uh, um, 
this is, you know, this is aggressive, right? And so when we lay this time frame out for folks, you know, it's, it's always about, are you going to be able to do this? Um, and really, you know, what's the choice, right? We don't have a choice at this point, right? We are, uh, we're, we're, we're failing too often uh, that we have to address these things. Yes. So um, it looks like you have implemented the XLD prior to the XLR. That's correct. There is a thought process. So that was, again, we, it was more about controlling the deployments for us first, right? So our, um, our DevOps folks are using XLR just for themselves personally, right? So, so none of the dashboards really are available to, you know, uh, executives or leadership teams. Um, we're not uh, pushing anything through the uh, development teams yet, right? So we're just tracking this for our own internal uses. Everything right now is just very, very manual, right? What we're trying to do is is get the development teams, right, and the overall larger community to understand there's a better way of doing things, right? And once we can get that buy-in and we start showing them repeated process, like, hey, you can do this, right? You can put it in, we can push the button, you know, and the magic dust gets applied and then it comes out the other end uh, the same way we used to do it manually, right? Except you don't have to do it anymore, right? Did you have a question back? Yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you're also in charge of change management. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So, so one of the new things we're going to get um, yeah, in our upgrade in September for a change management workspace is a, is a brand new API. So the existing API for, for Footprints 11.6, not very good. It works a little bit, but it's kind of clunky. Um, and so we've gotten a couple of things to be able to communicate, but not to where we really wanted to. So uh, we've kind of you know, pulled back on that, focused on some other things. When 12.0 goes live in September, um, where, you know, the APIs are, are supposedly more robust. We're doing testing now. We definitely want to tie those in, right? We want to make sure that uh, whether we're using release or the change system, the the uh, uh, the approvals flow either way. Um, and we also want to tie it into our, our project management system as well so that, um, you know, we can pull in project teams, right? A, a big part of that is compliance, right? So I'm sure no one here has to deal with compliance, right? Um, Right, they want to sign off on things, very specific things, right? But they don't want to be part of the change process. You know, I'm not part of the project team, right? I just want to see everything and sign off on it, right? So how do you do that? Well, so they have their own systems, right? And we're going to try to tie all that together, right? So that where you can pull approvals from anywhere, have them appear in one place, and then report on it like that as well. Not to stray too far, but just curious, so is part of it you know, implementing this tool does it mean that you can have more uh, high to standard changes? So, I mean, I guess that could be a benefit, but you know, in order, in, you know, in order to follow ITIL, right, you got to have a lot of other things, and, and a lot of people, like you know, we get people like. Point at the exact same way every single time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and and the you know the only thing with that is you got to have everyone has to kind of buy into that, right? So, um, we would love to 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 get closer to a, that tighter framework, you know. Um, but we're trying to fight the battles, right? The, the most important ones, or the ones that we think we can win first, right? And so a lot of this stuff, if we can do, right, we'll line up more closely with maybe some of the stuff that, that ITIL preaches, and then we can kind of say, hey, oh, by the way, look, you're already doing a lot of this stuff, right? Here are some other things maybe that we can start doing, right? Some service management, uh, that kind of stuff, and kind of get them roped in. Yes? So you're, you're implementing it on the lower levels with, with people. Yes. So are you really having the problem where the people along the process only feel like it only happens if it passes through their physical hands? Is that what you're up against? So the, the, the pushback, if I can call it that now, right, is just buying and just believing that it can actually work, right? Because it's a very old school mentality. Hey, I get, you know, I come in, I sit at my desk and I do my job, right? And, um, and if I'm not here, you know, it's not going to happen, right? So that's really the, the battle that we're fighting. Um, uh, a lot of the software teams, you know, they get it. They understand it. You know I mean? They, they've read about continuous integration and all these other things. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes I think we're from Missouri, right? So you got to show me, right? Just show me state. So they want to see it, right? You gotta, don't tell me about it, right? You got to show me. Uh, and, you know, and some, some people want to come along, right? Um, and then some people, you know, want to drag their feet, right? But you're always going to get that in, in these organizations. Um, 
again, for us, you know, we, we definitely want to rein in a lot of that control, right? So that we don't have, you know, the Mavericks out there who are just, oh, well, you know what? The heck with you, I'm going to stick with my process, right? Because then that, that's, you know, that's how you're going to screw it all up, right? If we have one or two guys over here doing their own thing, um, then that, that's really going to, uh, uh, to destroy what we're trying to do. Um, I've got a couple minutes left here. I'm going to move through very quickly. So finding success, Dad, the do's and don'ts, right? You've been getting do's and don'ts all day. Um, do prepare to be successful. So uh, when I took this on, you know, I said to myself that uh, there's no choice, right? We're going to be successful no matter what, right? I'm working every day anyway, right? Like, what's the worst that can happen? I got to work a little longer on any given day. Um, so, you know, focus on the end result and how the investment will pay off in the long run, right? So keep that in mind, right? And keep spreading that message to uh, your stakeholders, to your developers, to your ops people, right? And make sure they understand, like, we're not just doing this for, to get five changes in, right? Or for this month. We're doing this so we can do 300 changes, right? 1,000, 2,000 changes, whatever that number is. Uh, do your homework and document everything. So again, I mean, I can't stress enough, document, document, document. Uh, when you have processes in place, when you have things documented, it's very difficult for people to come back and say, well, what are you doing? Well, here it is, right? I, did you not get, I sent it to you last week. Oh, well, you know, I didn't have time to read it. Well, I don't have time to explain it to you, right? <laughs> so it's, you know, and it's really that simple, right? When you put it down, but if you don't, right, now, now it's hearsay, right? Now we might as well gather around the campfire and tell tribal stories, right? We got to put things down on paper and, and share that and communicate it out. Uh, communicate and celebrate each milestone as a victory, right? So the first weekend, um, we, we did a uh, production deployment. Um, I, I sent an email, I think, to every senior executive in IT and some on the business side, right? It was one change. <laughs> that was it. So we automated one change. But you know what? We made a big deal about it, right? Look, this is something we've never done before. And you know what? We did it in six months. And we did it with two people that weren't even part of the company six months ago, right? So we hired two DevOps guys who didn't even work for us. So they had to learn the company. They had to learn the culture. They had to learn the organization. Oh, and by the way, they didn't know anything about the tool, right? So um, and when you highlight that kind of stuff, right, that's the kind of stuff that does make it a big deal. And people go, wow, you know what? We can do this, right? This, this is not impossible. And then uh, do the financial analysis for everyone. He who gathers the information gets to tell the story, right? So if you leave it up to people to kind of decide, right, you know, they'll, they'll find ways to make it financially impossible, right? Uh, but if you have the data and you do your homework, pull that in. Tell the story that you want to tell, right? It's not, you know, you're, you're not stretching truths. You're not making stuff up. The data is there, right? You just need to structure it for people so they can see it, right? Otherwise, they're going to make things up. Uh, and see things the way they want to see it, right? Things that are financially reasonable for them. Uh, stay in the course. Don't. Uh, don't be discouraged, right? I mean, everyone runs into this, uh, and this is not new. This isn't even for debt. This is just everything in life, right? You're going to run into problems. You know, so-and-so quit. Uh, our head architect resigned on Friday. That's a true story. Um, you know, I mean, all, all sorts of stuff will happen, right? You can't let it deter you. Um, don't expect overnight results, this is a journey. Be, be patient, right? Um, and, and this is probably one that I have to keep telling my teams over and over again, right? Because they get frustrated. You know, this didn't work, or that didn't work, or this guy won't. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't accept my meeting, right? Okay, well, 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 let me see your meeting invite, right? Meeting. Discuss DevOps. All right, I, I would have declined too, right? Like, you didn't give me anything. What, what's, you know, did you set an agenda? Did you talk to them, right? Did you go stop by their desk? Did you call them on the phone first, right? So, you know, stay the course, be persistent, right? It, everything's not going to be roses. Uh, you are going to have to fight for uh, some of these things, right, for what you believe. And if it's the right thing, then you fight hard enough, uh, then, then it'll work. And don't bite off more than you can chew, right? Uh, you know, don't tell them you're bringing Maroon 5 and then bring the Dave Clark 5, right? So <laughs> if, you're going to, if you're going to stand up and say, look, we're going to do this, then you got to do it, right? So, so don't stand up and say, by the end of the year, we will automate all 6,000 changes, you know, that are going through the environment, right? Be realistic. Hey, you know what? By the end of the year, we want to automate 10%, right? And that may not sound like a lot, right? But then if you can deliver 20, then it sounds like, a, you know, then, then it's a really great story, 
right? Definitely don't bite off more than you can chew. Set their expectations up front. Let people understand that this is not easy, right? It's not an easy thing to do, right? A lot of crying, a lot of gnashing of teeth. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, when you're talking about, uh, you know, finances for executives, quality of life for employees, right? And then overall value return for uh, the entire organization as a whole, uh, that's really what sells your story, right? And you got to believe it. You got to believe it with conviction. All right, I didn't come here to talk today because I didn't believe it, right? I don't stand up in front of people at work and, and you know, swear up and down if I didn't believe we could get somewhere through this process, right? And people know, right? When, when, when you're not genuine, when you don't believe in what you're, what you're saying, they know it, right? So, so when you dive in, if you take the step, you got to believe in what you're talking about, right? Whatever that course is, whatever tool you choose, you know, you got to buy in and uh, and do the what do what's right for you. And that's it.